right. Thank you, Larry, and thank you for the invitation. Um, I've had the good fortune of being able to attend a number of these meetings at the invitation of um, several TAMIS members, and in uh, deference to that, actually, I'm going to sh tell you a short story tonight, or today, um, it was done in actually very recent work in collaboration with two of the TAMIS members. Um, as Larry pointed out yesterday, Dr. Shear expounded upon the virtues of fat cells and adipocytes and how great they are, and, but he hasn't yet come up with a pill that allows us to be fat, happy, and healthy. And so until he does, uh, the rest of us are stuck with trying to deal um, with fixing the organs that are damaged by his dysfunctional um, adipocytes. And the one that's affected most commonly is the liver. And many of you probably saw that movie that we started on, I had on the first slide, where the guy decided to eat McDonald's for a month. And the astonishing thing to me, when not, it wasn't a good movie, but um, the interesting thing was how quickly his liver function test changed. And this speaks to what Phil said yesterday. If we don't have the ability to store the fat in the places that it needs to be stored, it goes to other tissues, in this case the liver. And in a matter of two weeks, this individual's uh, liver function tests, uh, which are indication of liver damage, went from being completely normal to markedly abnormal. And so this can happen very rapidly. And as I said, it's a very common condition. And so the full spectrum of disease is called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, or NAFL. Um, it encompasses just pure fat in the liver, which is shown uh, in the lower left-hand corner. Um, that in itself may not be so damaging, but once inflammation and fibrosis sets in, uh, it can lead to full-blown cirrhosis, liver failure, and ultimately resulting in liver transplants. And as I said, this is a very common condition, as I'll show you. Fortunately, not everyone goes on to develop the most severe form of the disease. Um, this data is taken from another TAMIS members project, Helen Hobbs, um, who couldn't be here this time, but she drove the Dallas Heart Study um, in collaboration with actually Dr. Grundy, who is here. Uh, and they looked, one of the things that they looked at in the Dallas Heart Study, and this was a cross-sectional representation of about 3,000 or so individuals from Dallas County. One of the things they did was quantitatively measure liver fat in these individuals using NMR, which is the most sensitive way to measure fat in liver tissue. And they found that roughly a third of Dallas County residents um, have excess fat in their liver, or fatty liver. So a third of the population, you can imagine Houston probably isn't that much different than Dallas, nor is the rest of the country. So roughly a third of the U.S. population has excess fat in their liver. Um, this is the largest study still that's been done to date. And of note, this was done back in 2004, so it's likely that these numbers could even be higher. And you can see there is some ethnic disparity. I'm not going to comment on that any further, but we can discuss that later if you like. The reason that fatty liver is so common is because it's caused, uh, we think, uh, the underlying cause is obesity and insulin resistance. And many studies, including the Dallas Heart Study, um, show this clear correlation between your body mass index, your body weight, um, as well as levels of insulin sensitivity um, versus liver fat. So the fatter you are, the more likely you are to have fat in your liver. The more insulin resistant you are, uh, the more likely you are also to accumulate fat in your liver. And so how and why does this occur? And much of our work is focused on trying to determine that. Um, this, the equation is pretty simple. Um, either you make too much fat in your liver, uh, you take too much fat up from the adipocytes, uh, you have a block in secretion of fat from the liver, or you can't burn the fat in the mitochondria. And actually, we have specific examples of genetic defects in each of these pathways, which clearly cause fatty liver and can cause fatty liver disease. Uh, the question is, though, which causes the most common form of this, which is what we see with obesity and insulin resistance. And <laughs> the first clue into how this might occur um, started with the work of Brown and Goldstein um, in the early 90s when they discovered this family of transcription factors, sterile regulatory element binding proteins, or SREBPs. And they found a family of these transcription factors. There's actually three of these family members. And the SREBP2 form preferentially regulates genes involved in cholesterol synthesis. And the LDL receptor, which was, I think, what they were primarily interested at in, in the time. Um, but subsequently, they found a second family member, which was designated SREBP1, which actually activated all of the enzymes required to make fatty acids and triglycerides in the liver. And as you know, uh, in the liver, uh, insulin stimulates fat synthesis. So if you have hyperinsulinemia, um, high levels of insulin, the role of insulin is to convert excess glucose. So if we eat a meal, you have more insulin, more glucose in your blood. You want to store that. Um, for when the body might lead that uh, at, a, at a later time. And as a result, the liver converts this glucose into fat. 
and this is one, <coughs> this is transcription factor responds to insulin and is responsible for converting those excess carbons that we take in as glucose to fat um, storage in the form of triglycerides. And so early on, <coughs> trying to figure out what these transcription factors did, um, transgenic mice were made, uh, where this transcription factor was simply overexpressed in liver. And when that was done, you can see that these livers became very fatty, again, indicating that this transcription factor and the role of fat synthesis may be important in the development of, of fatty liver. And so the next question was fairly obvious, um, and whether this transcription factor and the genes that it activated were elevated in animal models of fatty liver disease. And the most common one used is this OBOB mouse. It's a mouse that's massively obese. Uh, Dr. Shear again introduced this mouse yesterday. And they have very high insulin levels. They're very insulin resistant. They eat continuously, and they develop a fatty liver. Um, this is just one of many animal models that have been studied. Um, and all of them to date have essentially shown the same thing, that indeed animals that have insulin resistance and are obese or have components of the metabolic syndrome um, have elevated levels of this transcription factor, SRBP1, in their liver. And as a result, this transcription factor activates all of these genes that are required to make triglycerides and fat synthesis is high. And this can be measured directly in the animals. In this case, we've injected mice with treated water so we can measure the incorporation of the treated water into newly formed fatty acids. And you can see that the OBOB animals have elevated fat synthesis rates in their liver. This is up, um, approximately four to five fold above those that we find in wild type mice. And as a result, their liver triglyceride concentrations, shown on the right, are also markedly elevated. Again, showing a correlation here between the rates of fat synthesis in the liver and the amount of fat that actually accumulates. So the next um, question, again, this is a slide um, from Brown and Goldstein, um, was again fairly obvious, and that was whether we could block the activity of this transcription factor, and would that have a positive impact in treating fatty liver or reducing fat within the liver? So how do you go about doing that? Well, this is a helix loop helix transcription factor, which blocking this specific transcription factor may be very difficult, thinking ahead therapeutically, <clears throat> um, to specifically block the activity of a basic helix, helix transcription factor would be very difficult with a small molecule. But fortunately, based on their work, it turns out that there are multiple targets that one could think about going after to block the activity of this transcription factor. And again, this is a summary, basically, of 20 years of their work, figuring out how this transcription factor is actually activated. And um, they knew from the beginning that it was cloned as a, as a membrane-bound transcription factor, which indicated that it must be cleaved to be active. And this is the pathway that they've worked out. And I'm not going to go through the details, but the point is that there's actually at least three different points in this pathway that one could intervene and <clears throat> therapeutically, potentially, in a much more rational way to actually block the activity of these transcription factors. One is with a protein called SCAP, which is a protein that actually moves the SRBP complex to the Golgi, where it has access to two proteases, which actually cleave it, releasing the active form of the transcription factor. So one could block the activity of SCAP one could block the activity of either of the two proteases, and as a result, you would have no active SRBPs in liver. And the approach <clears throat> that was taken initially was to start at the top and to draw, try to block the activity of SCAP to see if one could block then SRBP activity and have a positive impact on the development of fatty liver. And so this was done by generating knockout mice in the way Joel just described, a tissue-specific manner, um, so that the SCAP protein was deleted uh, from the livers of animals. And as a result, um, and again, this is consistent with what they would have shown in their culture studies, when you remove SCAP from the liver, there's no more active SRBP1 in the liver, and there's no more active SRBP2 in the liver. And so these animals were then bred to animals that develop a fatty liver to see if this would, removing SRBPs would have a positive impact, again, in reducing liver fat, and maybe also have a positive impact on plasma lipoprotein levels, which also tend to be elevated in obesity. And so they were bred again to these OBOB model, um, which is a, a, the fat insulin resistant mice. And again, the scap has been removed. There's no active SRBP1 in the liver and no S active SRBP2. These are Western blots. So the next thing was to see did this impact the rates of fat synthesis? The first thing we did was to look at RNA levels in the livers of these animals. 
Um, for those of you who don't remember your biochemistry, this is fatty acid biosynthetic pathway. These are the enzymes. The details of the enzymes are not important for today's talk. The point is that they're all elevated in animals that develop a fatty liver. So you can see wild type mice are set at one. Fatty liver animals have five to tenfold higher levels of these enzymes that make fat within the liver. When we removed SCAP and blocked SRBP activity, you can see the expression levels of these enzymes fell to that of wild type mice. And looking at triglyceride levels as well as fat synthesis, um, one can see that removing the activity of the SRBPs also reduced liver fat synthesis in the livers back to levels that were normal, as well as the liver fat content. And this is shown pictorially here, wild type mice, you can see the nice red liver, white liver of the fatty liver, and then those that lack SRBPs, the color of the liver returns to normal. This occurs independent of changing any uh, evidence of insulin resistance or um, glucose homeostasis, and I won't go through the details, but again, glucose tolerance and insulin tolerance is unchanged by changing liver fat, so um, it does not have a positive or a negative impact ultimately on uh, insulin resistance. And finally, <clears throat> Often hyperlipidemia is associated with insulin resistance, the metabolic syndrome, and one wondered whether blocking fat synthesis in liver might also have a positive impact on plasma lipoprotein levels, and particularly plasma fat levels, uh, which can be elevated in obesity. To test this, we changed animal models, changed to a hamster, which for reasons I won't get into are much better models for lipoprotein metabolism than mice are. Um, but we can't manipulate genes in hamsters um, like we can in mice. So we collaborated with a company called Alnylam, uh, which makes RNAi. We can give this systemically in liposomes so that we heard yesterday one of the downsides is that it only works in liver. For us, that's a good thing. Um, we inject this RNAi to knock down the gene. It goes to liver. SCAP is knocked down. And as a result, we can reduce the amount of SRBP in the liver. This is a control mismatch RNAi. <clears throat> And when we do this, this is an animal that we can feed just simple sugar to, and they develop many of the components of the metabolic syndrome. And when we knock down SRABPs by deleting SCAP, again, we lower the fat synthesis in the livers of these animals. And as a result, we also correct their high lipids in their blood. So when we feed this high-carbohydrate diet, plasma triglyceride levels go to almost 600, uh, which is very high plasma fat levels. Um, but by blocking fat synthesis in the liver, we can actually reduce this to what levels that we find in normal wild-type hamsters. Um, similarly, liver triglyceride content is reduced to normal again by blocking the activity of SRBPs. Um, finally, this is due to blocking secretion or reduced secretion of triglycerides from the liver. That makes sense. If you're making less fat, less triglycerides in the liver, you'd be secreting less from the liver. We can measure that directly in these animals and show that the amount of triglyceride being secreted from these livers is actually reduced by about 50 percent. So um, the conclusion of this, again, short story, um, is that blocking SRBP-dependent fat synthesis in the liver does see, seem to be sufficient to actually prevent fatty liver development as well as high triglyceride levels or high blood fat levels in insulin-resistant states. And given the previous work done by Brown and Goldstein, it, it opens the opportunity to, to block this pathway to at least three different states. And hopefully in the future, maybe different therapeutic options will become available for the treatment of hypertriglyceridemia as well as fatty liver. So I will stop and acknowledge the people that did the work. All the mouse work was done by Goxing Liang, the hamster work by Yang Ah Moon, and uh, Drs. Brown and Goldstein provided the proteins to play with. So I will stop and be happy to answer any questions. Dr. Wakil. Well, this is very interesting. Um, to see that the impact of um, using SI RNA for SCAP that gives you the lower uh, expression of both uh, SREBP1 and 2. But remember, we have a couple years ago um, found a small organic molecule which we call fetostatin, and it does impact the in inhibits cap action and lower the SREBP1, SREBP1, the two production and fatty acid synthesis is low, the uh, 
cholesterol is low, and if we use it with OBOB -OB mice, that uh, they lose weight, their type 2 diabetes improve, become normal, and their cholesterol is down. And so um, I like, you know, so this is, this seems to be uh, compatible to what we have done. Yes, you're right. So it's an interesting molecule Dr. Wakil's described um, that does appear to block some of the activity of SCAP. The difference between those studies and these, of course, is that you were, it was systemically given, and maybe that's the differences in the weight loss and so forth, which we don't see when we just didn't inhibit it um, specifically in liver. Um, but it does, again, illustrate that I think that this is a viable target moving forward. Our real concern and real motivation behind doing these studies initially were the, actually the plasma studies, which I kind of just barely touched on at the end because it wasn't so clear initially before the discovery of PCSK9, which is another protein that regulates the LD receptor, that blocking this pathway would be completely beneficial in actually lowering plasma lipids. But um, then that's why we went actually to the hamster models. So some years ago, I got interested in the question of why it is that a large number of different nuclear hormone receptors have anti-diabetic effects. There are eight or possibly more of them that show anti-diabetic effects in mouse models or in humans. And as we began to study that problem, what we found was that a common thread that does connect at least five of these effects is suppression of SRUP1C expression. So the messenger RNA goes down, the protein goes down, lipogenesis goes down, and insulin sensitivity appears to improve. So I think that there may be uh, other ways, as I'm sure you're well aware, of targeting diabetes via this same pathway. Oh, you mean other than? Other than SCAP. Oh, absolutely, yeah. So yeah, and then this, as I pointed out, did not actually improve any component exactly. that, as far as we can measure of diabetes. Um, so again, dissociating the liver fat from the insulin resistance in, in one instance. So there's a lot of debate in the literature whether liver fat causes insulin resistance or insulin resistance causes liver fat. This would be at least one model where we can normalize liver fat and have no impact on insulin resistance. Right. Dr. Horton, I have a uh, pretty general question. I mean, there are many obese people, but only a certain percentage, a low percentage, well, depends on how you look at it, a certain percentage who have fatty liver. And I just wonder why the variation, and the question is, fatty liver long-term is obviously not good for you, but is it possible that fatty liver is one mechanism of uh, you know, in the response, the protective response. You know, in mice, there are different strains of mice that have susceptibility to diabetes or they are more resistant to diabetes. For example, the C57 black mice are actually relatively resistant to diabetes and they develop fatty liver pretty readily. Whereas the uh, BTPR mice are very susceptible to diabetes and they don't develop uh, fatty liver actually, you know, much, it is, they're much more resistant. So in a way, if you just look at that, it seems to be protective. So what are your thoughts on these? Okay, so um, I'll try to make it brief. There's a lot of obvious questions. I mean, there's a lot wrapped up in your question, but it is true that everybody that is obese does not get a fatty liver. Why that is is an interesting question that I don't think anyone understands. Regarding insulin resistance, diabetes, and the development of fatty liver in different animal models, it looks, based on a lot of work by a lot of investigators, that the key underlying event is insulin resistance in the liver, and the hyperinsulinemia is a key component to drive SRBP expression in the fatty, and fatty acid synthesis and subsequently developing fatty liver. Without, once frank diabetes sets in, um, oftentimes insulin levels will drop. And, hyperglycemia develops, and, and under those circumstances, it may not be, uh, you may not still have that same drive to activate SRBP1 and uh, ultimately get fatty 